Hi everyone, I'm Mo. Welcome to Off By Heart Style and today I'm going to be talking about the book Never Night from Jay Kristoff. This book has to be probably one of the most frustrating reads I've had so far this year but it actually still was a wild ride. But anyways, let me give you the brief synopsis of what's going on in the story and I can just tell you my likes and things I had problems with and my overall thoughts of this extraordinarily wild, weird little book. Okay, so the synopsis goes basically that we are introduced to Mia who is the main character of Nevernight. It's very interesting with um, this character, the point of view kind of switches throughout the novel between first person and third person and a lot of the times Jay Kristoff makes a choice of actually kind of breaking the fourth wall if you will and I'll get more into that later. But Mia is an orphan. Um, she lives in this fictional place called God's Grave and we are to learn very early that her backstory is very tragic. Her father is killed. Her father was a rebel who was captured by the Senate of God's Grave and there's a few individuals that took it upon themselves to capture him and then he was publicly hanged which is obviously extraordinarily traumatic for a child. We as the readers are also told that her mother and baby brother were also killed even though the details on their deaths are very vague in the beginning. So Mia's orphaned and she's obviously full of anger and dreams of vengeance and wanting to avenge her family. So she's obviously having to fend for herself in God's grave in this, um, in this society and she happens to run into a retired assassin who belonged to an institution called the Red Church. The Red Church, which is his own um, religious sector that praises and worships the Lady of Night or the Lady or Goddess of Murder. So she happens to run into this man who is an retired assassin and he basically takes her under his wing and they basically form a relationship where it's very much guardian. Um, guardian and familial figure or like a mentor and mentee and he assists her in developing some street skills and preparing her to eventually try to become an apprentice of the Red Church and the Red Church the institution houses some of the most notorious assassins in this uh, in this fictional world and through training through the Red Church, she knows that she'll have the skills to become the Blade and then be able to come after the people that killed her family. So we meet quite a few characters along the way. Uh, she also has this incredibly interesting uh, power where she has the ability to control shadows. Uh, she can wield them as a shield and to temporarily blind others but also blinding herself and she also has like a shadow creature, shadow demon by the name of Mr. Kindly that follows her in every step she takes in her life since the passing of her family and he also too acts as a mentor as well as a friend who loves her and is her protector but also is kind of evil-ish <laughs> and um, it's interesting because she had a pet cat earlier on in the story by the name of Mr. Puddles which of course was also killed actually strangled and his neck twisted which is not cool and this shadow demon Mr. Kindly actually takes the form of a cat as well and provides a comfort to her and he's able to feed off of her fear making her that much more ruthless in learning of the skill sets so her and her mentor and Mr. Kindly are all working together and we as a readers are brought up to speed and brought into God's grave and through her journey of getting into the Red Church. So as far as the likes of Nevernight, I actually think it's a really interesting book. I'm actually really conflicted on how I feel on it as a whole. If I was to give it a rating system, 
uh, I'm typically not a harsh reviewer anyways but I tend to give books kind of like the three four star range but this book it, it's four star in the sense that I can tell that Jay Kristoff put a lot of thought and research into it and it's extremely well detailed world and the character voices are really interesting and he has a really interesting writing style that has dark humor elements in it. It switches in and out of POVs like I mentioned earlier. Sometimes the book reads as like third person, sometimes the book reads as first person and then Jay Kristoff is able to break the uh, fourth wall barrier with you the reader as well and kind of brings you into the fold. So it, it has a really interesting writing style and anytime you're dealing with fantasy, there's obviously a lot of world building elements and magic systems that you have to explain ahead of time. And you always have to have the stakes clearly defined while still introducing all of these um, different politics and other sectors and basically paint a really lush and vibrant world. So I always have an admiration for a skill set of any writer really but especially a fantasy writers it it takes a lot of work and you could tell that there was a lot that was put into this book so I just can appreciate that on a technical level um, I really liked Mia as our main character as well she's actually a lot of fun she has a really strong voice she has a sense of humor very witty very sarcastic um, she does have a bloodthirst and a nasty streak to her as well. I mean, she's training to be assassin, so obviously she's not going to be all cookies and cream. But um, there are elements of her being vulnerable as well, and the stakes are really clearly defined. Uh, you find out very quickly what happened to her and her backstory, and you feel for her for sure. And you're always reminded of what this journey will cost her both in morality and in her life essentially because she's in constant danger of wanting to be a part of the red church wanting to train with um these assassins to become part of uh the blade of the collective in being able to have that rite of passage that badge of honor to say you know what i'm the baddest of the bad i'm coming for everyone that has wronged me and my family and I am taking prisoners and there is going to be bloodshed. There will be blood. Uh, Jay Kristoff has a very lyrical writing style. Uh, some of the similes and <laughs> some of the metaphors, I, I'll be honest, I had to reread multiple times to really get what he was saying. Uh, that could just be me. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was very, really well descriptive. Uh, almost too descriptive at times, but overall, I did enjoy. I did enjoy his wordplay, and yeah, I thought it, it had a very interesting beat and cadence to it. Uh, Trick is one of the earlier characters that we come into, other than um, Mr. Kindly, which is her shadow creature and spirit that follows Mia around. Uh, Mercurio, I believe his name is, is the mentor slash retired assassin that originally acts as Mia's guardian who trains her to be ready to um, make a tithe and make a play for being able to enter the Red Church and then to become an apprentice of the Red Church. Um, but Trick is one of the earlier characters we meet. He's also a potential that wants to get into the Red Church. He has his own backstory as to why he wants to become an assassin as well. His backstory is also extremely tragic. A lot of death and loss in his family as well. And you are kind of curious about him at first because the character doesn't um, reveal a lot of who he is at first and just through their banter, uh, Trick and Mia's banter, you start to kind of peel back the layers and of course sexual tension is introduced really early between the two of them but I liked it. I actually liked their give and take. I love the fact that both characters can be extremely ruthless and cutthroat. I like that sometimes they are pretty abrasive with one another but they also had a lot of vulnerable moments vulnerable moments together as well and it was all really captivating and intriguing which I liked. The actual setup of Red Church is also super interesting. I've heard uh, comparisons of this book to Harry Potter and I found that to be true as well. So the Red Church has a, many different halls 
and many different um, ex-assassins who act as professors within this church that worship uh, the goddess or the lady of murder and they all have their own special skill sets that they are teaching these apprentice the apprentices of the red church or the acolytes and they're broken down into like one hall or sector deals with poisons and poison work and knowing different formulas and the chemistry of creating you know killer substances and then there's a hall or a sector that deals specifically with uh, weaponry and learning styles and battle of combat. And then there's another hall and a sector that deals with um, the art of seduction and manipulation. One of the things I love about that type of setup, and Harry Potter's not the only uh, series to do this as well, where you're dealing with a magical school boarding school type structure where you're bringing students in and they're learning about all these different dark arts. Um, I just, I, I really like uh, the trope that in certain books that whoever is a professor of poisons and deadly substances will first introduce themselves by finding a way to, and this might be a mini spoiler as a by the way, so just plug your ears for a second if you are stumbling upon this video and you haven't read this book yet. Um, the way that the instructor will introduce themselves is essentially poison their students and <laughs> they're like, yeah, so you have like five minutes to find the antidote to this or you're all going to die. And I always love that as students that want to become assassins or warriors or things of that nature, they never suspect that, you know, the food that's being given to them could potentially be laced with something. I always find that funny and interesting and it's not the first time I've seen that kind of trope play out in books, but I always enjoy it when that happens. There's also um, a couple of characters that on onset really dislike Mia and make it known to her that she should probably be sleeping with one eye open, if you know what I mean. So it's already a really tense structure. So the book is broken up into like three parts and by the time we get to the second part, the action really starts to go and it really enthralled me. There's also a lot of other aspects of this book that I really liked as well. Um, there was this incredibly well-crafted twist in the book and I knew going into this book that there was going to be a twist and I was kind of racking my brain because there's a few points in the book where there are red herrings from Jay Kristoff and I thought I was so smart and I thought yeah I got this totally figured out I know exactly what's going to happen and then when the twist actually happens towards the climax of the novel going into the final act I was completely blown away I did not see it coming for a mile which I love and Going back in my head, there was all the clues were planted throughout the entire novel, pretty much from the very beginning right towards the final act, which I really appreciate when writers do this. Twists are really hard to pull off well. There's twists that you as a reader can pretty much pick up on right away. And even though the writer still did their job because they set the pieces in place for you as a reader to connect the dots, it's still kind of disappointing payoff when you can figure it out ahead of time. And then there's twists where the author leaves absolutely zero clues and you're left dumbfounded thinking to yourself, where did that come from? There is absolutely nothing in a narrative beforehand to actually suggest that that would happen. Jay Kristoff actually did do his due diligence and laid all the clues out for you in plain sight and still because there's so much information being thrown at you, there's so much action, there's so much momentum being pushed through the different arcs and by the time you actually get to the twist itself you're like Pfft. so it, it, was, it was really good, it was really well done and by the time I got to that twist that was when my head kind of switched from thinking, okay, I don't know how I feel about this book to feeling, man, this book is amazing. I can see why people love it so much now. But there's part of his writing style that I took issue with and that was mainly that because his format is so unique, he included footnotes along the way in this book. So footnotes meaning that there are certain words or certain expressions that you as a reader are learning for the first time and he puts an asterisk next to it and on the page itself is indexed and it gives you a whole slew of information. 
Now this technique is used very heavily throughout the novel along with the point of views kind of switching from third, to third person to first person. So I'll be honest, at times this kind of took me out of the action of the story because you would see like asterisks here, asterisks there, and then having to look down to the page and like half the page almost is with condensed footnotes on a certain political figure in the history of God's grave. Um, different types of currency that is bartered about in God's grave, uh, different type of mythical creatures that you're introduced to as a reader. So a lot of the world building aspects that Jay Kristoff did was actually in the footnotes along with the information that we are given through the eyes of Mia. So there's times where this worked really well and Jay Kristoff has a certain uh, sense of humor which was, uh, which was fun and charming in some areas and in other areas it was actually kind of getting on my nerves. So after the while it's like okay can we kind of just slow down with the footnotes and kind of get to the main events and the main actions. So it does make the book stand apart but a lot of times I almost felt like it was like a lot of information dumping and unfortunately because there was a lot more footnotes in the earlier parts of the story I had a really hard time with the first maybe hundred or so pages. Actually, when I first read this book, I wasn't really sure I was going to finish it. I was pretty certain that I was going to shelve it actually with the amount of footnotes that was in it. So to my surprise, after a hundred some odd pages, you know, things really started happening at a fire rate where I was completely captivated. And then I talk about earlier that we get into the second act and then the third act and then the major twist and I was fully engaged. Yes, so in conclusion for Never Night, this is a fascinating book. I went through so many emotions while reading this. The highs of this book are incredible. There is some amazing action sequences, a lot of amazing fight sequences, uh, the, the romance or the courtship of Trick and Mia as well was fascinating and their traumas and their backstories and their histories intermingling with one another and that coloring their perception and views of one another going into the final act, acts of the book was really really well done. Uh, we get a lot of amazing characters in the fold as well. Uh, I will say that still I'm kind of at a crossroads whether I want to continue with the series or not. At filming this I'm still kind of <laughs> processing my thoughts about Nevernight and who knows maybe after filming this I might actually just go and get God's grave and bite the bullet and just plunge myself back into this world again. Definitely one of the more challenging fascinating reads I've had this year but I'm glad that I did finish it. I'm glad that I gave it a chance outside of those first hundred pages because like I said earlier I was really close to shelving it and I'm kind of glad I didn't because there was so much that I did enjoy and there's so much parts in the book that I actually would be happy to reread because I just love the way Jay laid that groundwork. There's other little problems and quibbles I had with it as well, but then this video would take so, so much longer than it needs to to conclude, so I'm going to leave it at there. Thank you for taking the time with me to uh, listen to my rambles and my...